Hey, it's your pal Mike Shea from SlyFlourish.com and on Twitter at twitter.com slash SlyFlourish. Today we're going to talk about some of the tools uh, of the Lazy Dungeon Master. I have a new book that I just recently put out called The Lazy Dungeon Master, where I talk about ways for dungeon masters to save themselves time and also make their game more interesting and more dynamic for their players. Today we're going to talk about some of the actual tools that I use for my regular weekly D&D game and have used for the past probably six months or so running uh, Dungeons & Dragons games, particularly running the Dungeons & Dragons Next, D&D Next uh, games. So um, many of these tools are very easy to come by. They're very cheap. They're, you can pick up almost all of them up on Amazon, which I, which I do myself, and uh, many of them will save you lots of time when you're running your game. So jumping right in, uh, for one of the things that we want to do is make sure that our players are not sacrificed, that, that our using less time for ourselves doesn't sacrifice the enjoyment for our players. So we want to make sure that they get interesting things to use for their, for their, for their game. Uh, I find that the maps that come with Game Worlds, this is the one that we use for Eberron, and, uh, is a nice thing to refer to regularly and a nice thing to have out on the table when people are starting the game to get a reference of where they are. I also like handouts. Uh, handouts are one of the few things that I will spend a fair bit of time on. And even still, a handout like this, you know, which looks like an authentic piece of a uh, uh, little bit of memorabilia that a character might pick up. This looks pretty extensive and actually doesn't take a whole lot of time once you're used to building something like this. The paper that I use for this is a parchment paper that you can buy uh, and uh, looks you know, like a nice kind of rustic piece of paper. I also like handouts for area maps. This came out of Isle of Dread, and uh, it's a nice way for players to get references. And you can also do puzzle sheets and things like this. Once you start to use cipher puzzles, if you don't know anything about cipher puzzles, you can look them up. Cipher pub puzzles are a nice, fun puzzle for people to figure out that uh, uh, adds a little bit of fun beyond just role-playing and, and action. And then uh, a map for players to actually fill out. And graph paper, if you want to get really old school and tell them that it's time to graph a map out, this is what they're using for... Uh, slave Pits of Undercity. So those are pretty easy to come by and pretty easy to set up and they add some nice kind of tactile tactile handouts for players. Uh, I keep copies of all the character sheets of our players. It's easier for them. Then when they show up at the game, they're all ready to go. All I have to do is pull it out of the envelope. Uh, these little binder clips, I bought a pack of multicolored binder clips. I like these a lot better than paper clips. They really hold everything together. So almost everything else that you'll see here that's paper-based, I use binder clips to keep separated. And the color coding, you know, you don't want to get too crazy with what color means what, but it's nice to be able to know that the green ones are your initiative cards or whatever. You can kind of quickly grab them up. This is a great tool that I like very much. It is a single big 5x8 card that has a bunch of random names. And when you're coming up with NPCs or people are exploring outside of where you expected, pull a random name off, scratch it off a list, or write it down on another 3x5 card so you remember who they are. That works really well. Uh, and then what I use in conjunction with those are these. These are the Paizo face, uh, NPC face cards. You can buy packs of these uh, on Amazon. They're about 10 bucks, eight, eight bucks or so a pack. They contain 52 face cards. And I use them to kind of represent NPCs. And what I do is I'll you know find a card that fits the NPC I'm thinking about. And on the back, I will throw a uh, sticky note with just some notes down like a random name, if I happen to use a random name, or uh, and any other little attributes or little story hooks that are associated with them. So I have a bunch of those, and there's the sticky notes that I use. And again, I'll do this on the fly while we're playing. I don't necessarily spend a whole lot of time before the game figuring out what's what. Some of these I did figure out beforehand, but many of them I just grabbed as they, as they met people. Uh, so those face cards work really well. If you want to add a little bit of detail and you don't want to spend much time figuring out their background, these story cubes are really interesting. Rory story cubes. They are uh, six-sided dice with just weird symbols and shapes and things. And you can say, like, okay, you know... Oh, crap, I just dropped one. Oh, let me pull another one out here. So you can grab a face card. Let's see if we can do this one-handed. Oh, this is going to be a mess. Oh, there go all my face cards. So you pick out a guy, say, oh, it's this dwarven fella. You found him in the bottom of the slave pit. His name is, oh, what's a good name? Arvin? Mm, Libert. Gaunt. We'll use that one. Gaunt is his name. And Gaunt, before he was captured by the slave lords, oh, he's a daydreamer. He always, you know, people didn't really, uh, you know, they always thought he was thinking too hard. But he was very good. He was an investigator. 
and he always came up with bright ideas. So he's a big dreamer, but he also was a very detail-oriented fella. Maybe he's a little bit of Asperger's, and he, uh, but he's a big idea guy. So, oh, I know, we can do X, you know, so that kind of gave him, and then he was grabbed up by the slave lords and stuck into a pit, but he's probably one of the guys that's escaping the most. So very quickly, you can kind of come up with a name and background, Gaunt, and then you write it down on your 3x5 card, or your sticky note, and you stick it back in the thing. Uh, I use 3x5 cards for everything. So I have 3x5 cards for each of the players, each of the player characters. It helps me remember their names. I jot down the things that the players told me about their backgrounds, and I also write down little hooks about what the, player, the player's expectations for what they want from the character. Uh, all these characters are also interrelated, so I have all the interrelations kind of written down so that I remember that. And then for each session, I write a 3x5 card up of kind of what I expect you know, where I expect the game is going to start. So the start is the most important part in my mind. And then maybe a couple notes about where things might go or what might happen. It just helps me feel like I've got some idea of what things might happen. And then I'm happy, because it's only a 3x5 card, I'm happy to throw it away when I'm done. And then, uh, so I, I've been running a lot of first edition modules. Uh, this is the Slate Pits of Undercity module and the Isle of Dread module that I've been running through. Um, and I like to keep those on hand at any given time. The other, another great tool are these initiative cards. Uh, I got this from uh, Teos Abadilla, Abadilla, and he uh, showed me this when we were at D&D uh, uh, &D Experience last year. Basically, you just do initiative, you hand the card out, you throw it in front of somebody, and uh, uh, that way you can keep track of who does what. Now, when you're doing initiative, though, you want to actually use the names of the characters. Uh, it helps reinforce the game, and it helps you remember the characters' names, so you're not just saying, yo, Mike, it's your turn. So those work out really well. Um, what else? Big fan of these big black markers. Uh, these are retractable, large retractable markers, and they're great for wet end or for, for dry erase poster maps. They're great for uh, all sorts of things. A nice, nice big marker. And then I also use a uh, you know eight eight inch by eleven inch. This one was a school handwriting thing. Works really nice for tracking monster damage and tracking other things. Uh, you can draw right on it and erase it very easily. And then I pack most of this stuff up into one of these. This is a polyethylene uh, uh, folder, big indestructible folder. It's the one that's got these, strap, these straps so it holds it down. Really strong. I can throw it in a backpack if I happen to be going somewhere. And uh, I think you can pick up about six of them for about 20 bucks. Uh, I wasn't able to find them much cheaper for singles. But you can pick them up at Staples or anywhere else. And the color coding is kind of nice if you happen to be running multiple campaigns. And then as you see underneath this is a Paizo uh, flip mat. I'm a big fan of the dry erase flip mats that Paizo sells. And over the top of this I have an acrylic sheet. So it lets me draw right on it. There's no seams. It keeps everything straight. You know, very easy to, to kind of draw. And you can draw large maps, you can draw small maps, you can draw whatever you need. So it's kind of nice to have almost a, essentially a big whiteboard right in front of you and the players that can be used either for tactical maps or for, uh, you know, sort of any drawing that you want to draw. If you need to draw a side view of something, you can. So these are all of the tools that I use. Again, I think that preparing, having the tools ahead of time to run an improvised game makes life a lot easier. And it means that between sessions, you have to spend a lot less time preparing. Uh, I hope this video was useful, and uh, if you liked it, please visit my site at slyflourish.com. Take a look at my book, The Lazy Dungeon Master, at slyflourish.com slash lazydm, uh, or visit me on Twitter at twitter.com slash slyflourish. Thank you very much.